welcome everyone. This year, in celebration of Harvard's 375th birthday, it's been my great pleasure to invite back to campus some of Harvard's most accomplished alumni to refresh our connections with them and to allow them to share something of their lives and thoughts with this uh, wonderful Harvard community. This afternoon, it is a privilege to join with this outstanding group of panelists in welcoming back to Cambridge our very distinguished guest. Henry Kissinger is among Harvard's most legendary graduates, a key architect of US foreign policy during the last half century, national security advisor and secretary of state to presidents Nixon and Ford, renowned scholar of international relations, recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize and the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and a public figure who has shaped an era. He's also one of Harvard's most legendary students. His ties to Harvard go back more than 65 years when he was accepted despite a late application to the Harvard College class of 1950 a remarkable group, including many who attended on the GI Bill. He arrived in the fall of 1947 as a 24-year-old sophomore with a bronze star from his service in the US Infantry and Counterintelligence Corps, with an ambition, as he put it, to acquire a liberal arts education, and with a cocker spaniel named Smokey whose presence in the dorm, where no dogs were allowed, was perhaps an early testament to the new student's talent for diplomacy. <laughs> His seriousness of purpose and intellectual brilliance quickly became apparent. As the story goes, the young Kissinger knocked on the door of his government professor, the erudite and flamboyant William Yandel Elliott, who allegedly looked up from his work and said, oh my God, another 2T. Within a few months, Eliot had declared his new 2T, in his words, a combination of Kant and Spinoza, and the two formed a rare bond. As our guest later recalled, Eliot made me discover Dostoevsky and Hegel, Kant, Spinoza, and Homer. Eliot's encouragement to read broadly combined with Kissinger's own inclination for thinking deeply and produced a now renowned senior thesis titled The Meaning of History. It tackled fundamental questions of philosophy and statesmanship and earned a summa cum laude to add to his Phi Beta Kappa. It was also 388 pages long famously prompting, as the undergraduates in the audience might appreciate, a limit of 150 pages on all future government theses. <laughs> so began Henry Kissinger's long and remarkable Harvard career. As a second year graduate student, he and Professor Elliott launched the Harvard International Seminar a summer program for young leaders and intellectuals from around the world. From that seminar, Kissinger dreamed up, as he put it, a journal called Confluence, whose first issue took on the question, what are the bases of civilization? Not yet 30 years old, he would draw in an impressive array of contributors, including Reinhold Niebuhr, Hannah Arendt, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., John Kenneth Galbraith, Hans Mordenthau. By 1954, he had completed his dissertation, a reflective historical study of European statesmen and the nature of war and peace, a work that would later inform his own actions on the world stage. He then served on the Harvard faculty as associate director of the Center for International Affairs Director of Defense Studies Program, and for more than 15 years as a member of the government department until he left for Washington in 1969. In 1975, 
he wrote in the 25th anniversary report of the class of 1950 that he had been sworn in as Secretary of State in 1973 when he affirmed that despite the turmoil and traumatic events of that time, America is resilient. He continued, the dynamism of this country is irrepressible. Dr. Kissinger remains an advisor to leaders around the globe, a distinctive voice engaged in the profound challenges facing the United States and the world today. His book on China, published last year, continues the intellectual quest he began at Harvard, a unique kind of hybrid analysis, both historical and personal, that, as one scholar described it, in this case sets out to make sense of China's diplomacy and foreign policies across two and a half millennia and to bring China's past full circle in order to illuminate the present. A fellow student once called Henry Kissinger's work here a conversation with himself on some of humanity's deepest questions. Harvard was fortunate to have been a formative part of that conversation. And we are very fortunate to continue that conversation today as we welcome back Dr. Henry Kissinger. Before I turn the panel over to Dr. Graham Allison, Dr. Kissinger would like to say a few words. When Dr. Fouts came to see me a few months ago. I want to make a citizen arrest for Henry Kissinger. This man is a war criminal. He's responsible for millions of people's deaths. He is now in Cambodia, Laos, Latin America. This man is a war criminal and a murderer. And how can I honor this man? He's said, stay on Harvard. Stay on Harvard. My ship. My ship. This man is a war criminal. Excuse me. It meant a great deal to me when uh, Dr. Fouts called on me in New York a few months ago to invite me here to give a lecture on the occasion of the 375th anniversary of Harvard. And I thought I'd make a few comments of why Harvard had been so important in my life. I came to this country in 1938 and was drafted in 1943, and in the interval, as an immigrant, I had to work in a factory during the day and go to school at night. So then I spent four years in the Army, three of them in uh, the Army of Occupation. So coming back to this country in 1947 was a second immigration. And the GI Bill of Rights made it possible for me to go to uh, college uh, in the daytime. So I had no idea what it took to get into college. So in May of 1947, I applied to 10 different colleges and got rejected by nine of them, <laughs> uh, not on merit, uh, but on principle. Uh, because what made me think that in May of the year that I wanted to go to college, uh, it was possible to admit me. And secondly, why did not I go back to the night school from which I had come? And Harvard had 
the, uh, the friendship and what, whatever the, uh, the Harvard accepted me at a time when it was very hard for veterans uh, to come back here. And Harvard had over accepted people, so the, for the first two weeks, we had to sleep in the gymnasium in double-decker beds before I was moved, before I could move to Claverley Hall. And I didn't get into a house until, uh, until the uh, following year. So I was a lot, there were a few characteristics of Harvard. They gave me credit for courses I had taken in the army. They didn't give me credit for courses I had taught in the <laughs> army. <laughs> and, uh, so I was not clear what I was going to do. I got some spectacular grades in chemistry one and went to Professor Kipjakovsky, who was a very famous chemist, and asked him whether he thought I might should concentrate in chemistry. Uh, and he said, if you have to ask me, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in later years, he had several occasions to complain about some of my views. And I told him he could have easily solved his problem <laughs> <laughs> a few years uh, earlier. Uh, Dr. Faust uh, mentioned the uh, assignment to William Yandel Elliott. He was a, uh, a big figure. He, he was a poet who belonged to a group called the Fugitives. Uh, and uh, he was a Southern Democrat, which was as conservative as you could get on the, and still get on the Harvard faculty <laughs> at that time. And he was not thrilled to get another student, so he assigned me as a topic the connection between the Kant's ethics and his views on peace. So he didn't see me for three months while I was working on this. But he helped shape the direction of inquiries in which I, uh, I uh, later became uh, interested. Uh, one other vignette that may interest you is that while I was in the army, I uh, was very attached to a cocker spaniel whom I had kept on an army base and brought home and whom my mother was taking care of. Then my father fell ill, so I admitted Smokey to Harvard <laughs> and took him to Claverly Hall, where I don't know how I managed to hide him out. After a few months, the dean called me in and said, we are aware of, of the dog. <laughs> uh, this was uh, about April of the second term. He said, we are aware of the dog. And if you don't do something about it, we will have to start disciplinary proceedings which will take a few weeks, which I interpreted perhaps wrongly, to mean just don't be too visible about it, but <laughs> get him out of here by the end of the semester, which is what happened. At any rate, uh, I had many warm associations. We used to have a seminar every Saturday afternoon of faculty of Harvard and MIT about the problems of 
what to do about the emerging nuclear weapons. So this is what Harvard meant to me in my formative uh, period and uh, why I was happy when Dr. Faust called on me. She suggested a lecture. I thought it might be more interesting to have a dialogue. And then it was suggested that some faculty members uh, interview me first, and then students have an opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. And I'm happy that this occasion uh, has been created. We have no, we've had no previous agreement as to subject or directions. And uh, with this, if you permit me, Dr. Faust, let me thank you for the invitation, which means a lot to me. And thank you all for coming. I'll now turn the proceedings over to Graham Allison, who is the Douglas Dillon Professor in the Harvard Kennedy School. He is an advisor to presidents, both Republican and Democratic, and a former dean of the Kennedy School. Graham, thank you. Thank you. So uh, Henry suggested that this be a conversation rather than a speech, and the way we propose to proceed is uh, we'll ask a few questions, the panelists here, and then we'll open it up for questions from the floor. There's no restrictions on questions that, to be asked, but I hope that the audience will be respectful of the fact that many people have questions that they would like to ask, and that we've come to hear Dr. Kissinger's views, not uh, those of others. So there's no restriction on the questions, but I hope people will be respectful of other people's concerns, the reason they came here. I thought, Henry, uh, in composing this, this panel, that we would uh, take phases of your life at Harvard. Uh, so Jessica Blankstein is a graduate student in the Gov Department uh, a, writing a thesis, which is what Henry was doing six decades ago in the Gov Department. So she looks a little different than the time, but <laughs> similar, okay? Uh, Joe Nye was a junior faculty colleague of Henry's at the Center for International Affairs five decades ago. And I had the good fortune to be Henry's course assistant uh, just before he left for Washington uh, in 1969, now just over four decades ago. So these are kind of, uh, I don't know, ghosts from your past or phases of your life. I thought we would start with Jessica. Thank you. Uh, so as the graduate student on the panel, uh, who's a bit preoccupied with my own dissertation at the moment, I would like to take us back to your dissertation, uh, your rather intimidating dissertation, uh, which became a book, A World Restored. Uh, and in the introduction to that book, you write, every statesman must attempt to reconcile what is considered just with what is considered possible. What is considered just depends on the domestic structure of his state. What is possible depends on its resources, geographic position, and determination, and on the resources, determination, and domestic structure of other states. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your personal experience with the tensions that you highlight in the book between circumstances and the individual statement and statesmen and between what is just and what is possible. Well, I would put it um, in this form. Uh, between the difference of the perspective of an observer, including professors, journalists, uh, and those of practicing statesmen. Uh, the outsider can pick his topic. He can work on it for as long as he or she wants. Uh, he can choose the best possible vision of it. And he has the option 
of changing his mind. None of these elements exist for statesmen. Issues present themselves. They must be dealt with in a finite period of time. So, and I and Graham, we have personally experienced in government that at the end of each day, you know that there are some problems you cannot deal with. And so it's always a choice, not always, but often a choice between the urgent and the important. Uh, and very often it happens that you must give more attention to the urgent uh, uh, than the important. Then, as a professor or outsider, things don't work out just exactly how you visualize, you have the option of writing another book. <laughs> For the statesman, uh, the choices are irrevocable. And so he or it's always to balance the risks against the opportunities. And then there is one other even general aspect. When one talks about the morality of actions, uh, they are and have to be and properly are put in absolute terms. But when one talks about the me measures that can be taken for the reasons that I gave, they have to be taken over a period of time. So in philosophy courses, you deal with absolutes. In statesmanship, you deal with nuances. And you justify the ethics of it by the accumulation of nuances. And that is what produces dilemmas. Uh, now, I'm sure everybody has in his uh, her mind the, well, okay, give me some, concrete examples. Uh, the, uh, anybody in high office or in, will want to be, make a contribution to peace. That is a given. It's not always recognized in the debate, but it's inherent uh, in uh, the job. And our country went through this in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. And, uh, but once you postulate that, how do you do it? Uh, the administration, which I joined in 69, uh, found 550,000 troops 9,000 miles away from the United States in the middle of a Cold War. So it was one thing to say we should end that war. It's another how you can do that in a manner that does not, in the middle of the Cold War, inflame uh, the, the whole situation. I'm not arguing in, in Iraq and now in Afghanistan we have exactly the same problem. And the, so uh, what we should look at is every war that the United States has fought since the end of World War II has started with great enthusiasm and with almost universal agreement. Then as the objectives were elaborated, in absolute terms and proved not to be reachable at some point in that conflict, the only argument becomes how quickly can you withdraw? And then withdrawal strategy becomes the only policy. Now this gap has to be closed. Perhaps the objectives, the objectives and the possibilities have to be reconciled and that's what I was getting at uh, 
50 years ago when I wrote that thesis. And I think you're still, uh, still struggling with it. Ghost? It's the fundamental problem of, of statement. Henry, when I was a graduate student, we were all terrified of you. <laughs> and the, uh, there was a nasty tale we used to tell among graduate students behind your back, and it was that Henry speaks with a German accent here, but in Germany he's careful to speak with an American accent. You'll have to tell us whether that was true or not. No, but I any speak German with an undefinable accent. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, when I showed up at my general exams where you're grilled for half an hour by a professor and you were my professor on international relations and you grilled me for a half an hour on the balance of power in Europe, I realized that today I am having every graduate student's fondest dream the chance to return the favor, <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> but I, do, I was interested as I was reading your book on China, which I like very much, that when I got to the end of it, you were refuting this realist view that there's an inevitable conflict between the United States and China based on the analogy with Europe before World War I. And you have a wonderful description of Air Crow's memorandum and the situation in Europe. And I was wondering, would you have expected that when you were th teaching us way back when? In other words, how much have your views changed uh, w from the point where you were teaching us as graduate students and to your epilogue today to the China book, which I happen to agree with? Uh, it's an important question. When I wrote, uh, what, when I was a professor here, my thought was of writing three books on the making of peace in the 19th century and the disintegration of peace into World War I. And the first one I finished, it was the one to which Joe referred. Uh, the second was about Bismarck because he began the disintegration of the international system and then I was only half finished before I went off doing other things. And the third, the outbreak of World War I, I thought about a lot but I never uh, uh, managed uh, to write about. I guess in the Cold War, I would have believed that the balance of power was the determining element, uh, that long periods of peace were possible, but it required a combination of concepts of legitimacy and concepts of power. And that I still believe to an important extent. But if one looks at the history one would say when a rising power confronts a status quo power and when these two powers operate on a global scale, they will impinge on each other so much that if you settle the disputes primarily in balance of power terms, a conflict is inevitable sooner or later. And I might have thought then that that was inevitable. It was inherent in the system. But I have also often asked myself this question. If the statesmen in 1914 that went to war in 1914 had known what the world would look like in 1919, would they ever have gone to war? And considering the cataclysmic impact of that war, uh, I think uh, the answer is pretty plain. Now you have two superpowers or potential superpowers. You have nuclear weapons. And you have, in addition, a set of problems that are global in nature and can only be solved on a global basis. So to deal with 
international relations entirely in terms of conflict is no longer adequate. And that's particularly true in relations between China and the United States. Compared to the European countries that went to war, China and the United States are continental countries. They're countries, moreover, that have no experience in the management of international systems. We, because of geographic isolation, the Chinese, because they were the dominant country in their region for practically all of their history until colonialism uh, took over. So therefore, I believe it essential that we avoid the dilemmas that led to World War I, and that China and the United States find a way of recognizing that they live in a world of great danger, but also of the necessity but that some problems like environment, proliferation, climate change can only be dealt with on a global basis. Now that is going to be very difficult. Every time we have a political campaign, uh, the, the argument is made that China is a major threat. If you read the Chinese literature, there's always a faction that argues that the United States represents a threat. And both are right in a certain sense. So the challenge I tried to point to in this book is that the state leaders on both sides have to make a decision before they get into these crises of working on cooperative solutions. Now, from a strictly realist point of view, you can say that's, a super, that's, that's not possible. And that may turn out to be the case. But I have argued that we absolutely owe it to ourselves uh, to make that effort. And having known Chinese leaders over the decades, I also think there are enough of them to understand the difficulty. But one has to add, here are two societies with different premises, different cultures, totally different view of history. Uh, so it's a big task. And on the positive side, one has to say that eight American administration since the opening of China have come to substantially the same conclusion, which is very rare in the way we conduct, uh, uh, we, we conduct policy. And a number of Chinese administrations, the same way. But there is uh, <clears throat> potential for turbulence. But I would say that is one of the biggest challenges of our time. Let me, let, me, let me drill down on that one just a little bit, because I also like the China book a lot. But when I get to the conclusion and I read about Kant and perpetual peace, I thought, wait a minute, let me go back and see if this is Henry writing this. And then you told us today that Eliot had put you on to Kant, uh, where you had to connect the, I guess, the critique of pure reason with perpetual peace a long time ago. I didn't know, I never heard that chapter. Uh, but when, when I try to take the picture that Kant paints of perpetual peace, it's quite at odds with traditional realist analysis. And uh, so when, you, when you're trying to, to, to give more content to this, you then give a, a term to it you call co-evolution, but it also that's not so fully developed. Are, are all these concepts that, I mean, you're talking to, let's say, the new Chinese leader. Are these ideas that are, 
feasible or 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 abstract? Uh, at this moment, they're abstract. Uh, now, first of all, I don't like the uh, term. I, I don't like the distinction between realist and idealist. And I know it's the, just to make sure that uh, people don't like it, they say uh, that I like real politic. Now it's a German word, so you, you can oppose it. Uh, the, I don't think that's a meaningful distinction. Uh, because when I said realists look only at power, you can't look only at power because what realists ought to do is to look at all the elements that are relevant to the understanding of a problem. And, the, and states are never just like billiard balls uh, that operate by their uh, physical momentum. States always represent as the domestic ideas of justice and sometimes general uh, uh, ideas of justice. So uh, any realist thinker must take this into account. In the 19th century, Bismarck was considered the ultimate realist. But on one occasion, he said, the best a statesman can do is listen to the footsteps of God catch hold of the hem of his cloak and walk with him a few steps of the way. So that values always play a certain role. Now idealists like to say that their values overwhelm all practical considerations and that you can go from the intuition of values uh, to their realization. And on top of it in a very short time, uh, there, is not, there are not many examples in history where this can be said to be true. And one has to add to it another fact that crusades have usually caused even more casualties than other wars. Uh, so the real decision that has to be made is where in this spectrum between power and ideals, you place your policy. You would like to see it at the outer limit of where values are relevant. And sometimes one succeeds and sometimes one fails. Every leader thinks he's done the best he can do. And the task of a university and of an observer is to say, even if it's the best you can do, is it the best that can be done? That's the real question that one has to, uh, uh, that one has to address and one should not wallow in self-righteousness uh, that one knows all the answers on either side of that dispute. Jessica, when we go to the policy agenda, if we can uh, jump over, or we can go wherever right, you want to go. All right, excellent. Um, so stay, I wanted to stay on China for a minute. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about some of the, the personalities that you've no negotiated with on the Chinese side, starting with Chairman Mao 40 years ago uh, through now, and sort of what those negotiations were like, and then looking forward, uh, what you expect, given all of the transitions that we're seeing within the Chinese leadership this year, expected and unexpected. Well, uh, the, cha the Chairman Mao caused unspeakable suffering. It's an practically undisputable, it's an undisputable fact. And he put his society through domestic upheavals of magnitude intolerable to most societies. Uh, but it is also a fact that he was a considerable strategic thinker in foreign policy. 
side by side with this messianic domestic uh, uh, domestic view. So when I encountered him, he was already uh, he he was he was the established leader, and so meetings with him were never scheduled. Uh, you would be at a meeting with other Chinese leaders, and they'd be at scurrying, and then somebody would, and then they would say, the chairman is ready to receive you, which means, meant in practice, now. Uh, and uh, so you'd be taken to him. Uh, he lived, well, he received visitors in a house that was not distinguished at all in a room, the floor of which was covered with books, and at the center of which was a semicircle. Uh, uh, but he was a very commanding personality. And the essence of his conversations, uh, most statesmen, well, most political leaders that you deal with say, I have five points to make, or whatever points. Uh, he wouldn't do that. He would begin with a question. What do you think of this? And then he would he'd comment on your answer very often sarcastically. Uh, so I can give you one comment. He said, uh, you Americans sometimes remind me of swallows who fly up into the air when a storm approaches and flap your wings. <laughs> but you and I know that the flapping of the wings does not affect the coming of the storm. So once you reach that point, uh, but fundamentally, he led it towards a uh, direction. So he was a very, uh, very powerful uh, mind who, in terms of relations with the United States, uh, to show you the reliability of intelligence reports, uh, the CIA was unanimous on one point that logically China should open relations with the United States, but this could never happen while Mao was still alive. Uh, they made a report like that two months before it happened. So uh, he then made a dramatic shift, and he understood that the major problems between the two countries had to be put either on ice or put into a framework where they could be settled gradually. And so he uh, was formidable, but you knew that you were dealing with a different uh, worldview and also a different uh, philosophy. On the other end, uh, a, a leader that I had huge regard for was President Sadat of, of Egypt, uh, because he uh, uh, he did not negotiate that way at all. Uh, but he was also in a different position. Uh, but Sadat. We had the opportunity to make three agreements in an 18-month period. But it could never have happened without Sadat being willing to cut through, uh, uh, again, if I can give an example uh, how they worked. I was the uh, shuttle diplomacy was needed because the Arabs were not talking to the Israelis. And uh, 
So I had to deliver messages from both sides. So at one point, the issue was uh, Israel had agreed to withdraw from the Suez Canal a distance, I forget, of how many miles. How many tanks Egypt could put into the zone that the Israelis had vacated. The uh, Egyptian, the Israeli message was 30 tanks, about a 200 mile area. Uh, my policy was to deliver every message once. So I delivered that message, and the uh, Egyptian chief of staff burst into tears of rage and said, I'll never sign anything like this. You can't ask me to sign this. And the foreign minister spoke in the same sense. Sadat so said, let's go to the next room, to me. And he had said to me, does she mean it, she being Golda Meir? I said, no, she doesn't mean it, but you have to decide how long you want to hang in there. And so he went back, and that's the key point, to the other, to the two Egyptians and said, I've accepted 30. Dr. Kissinger will get me more and you'll sign it. And so we came up with some number in subsequent negotiations. And I came back with that number. And Sadat said, now you go back to the Prime Minister, P. Golda and tell her I will put no tanks across the canal. Because if I want to go to war, these restrictions don't mean anything. And if I don't want to go to war, I don't need any tanks across the canal. So we will have none, but she should understand that the dignity of our the people should also be respected. Now, I'm not arguing who was right in the details, but here was a man who could get to the heart of a problem. And, uh, so I don't know whether no. you want me to go on. There are other examples, <laughs> but it's, I think I've illustrated the two. So at, at, uh, very soon, we're going to come to the audience, so you might be thinking of your questions, but let me get Joe to ask another question. Henry's answer, and then we'll go to the floor. And I think there are microphones on, it's hard to see here, but on the ground level and on the next level, and stand up at the microphones, yeah? Henry, as you look back over your distinguished career as a statesman, are there things that, in retrospect, you would have done differently? In other words, are there things, either actions you took that you wish you'd taken another action or hadn't taken that action? Or alternatively, were there challenges and possibilities that now in retrospect you missed, either because you didn't have time or because they weren't as clear as they might be at the time? But with the benefit of history and hindsight, looking back at your role as a statesman, what would be the takeovers, the do-overs that you might uh, think about? You know, I'm often asked that, uh, that question. And I have to give uh, the, following answer, the following answer. Uh, I had have, I have spent all my life thinking about these problems. I've been lucky that my hobby became my profession. So if I hadn't been in these positions, I would have read about this sort of thing. So I had clearly formed strategic views. I call your attention to the distinction I made before. When somebody says, I did the best I could do, that still doesn't prevent you from saying, this wasn't the best that could be done. So on the strategic 
issues uh, with which I dealt. If we take the Vietnam War, uh, when when uh, Nixon came into office, as I said, there were 550,000 troops in Vietnam. And just, and you can't just march them out as you now see in Afghanistan and so in Iraq with much uh, smaller uh, forces. And so in looking at the options, uh, we came up with the option of withdrawal of about 150,000 a year uh, to a point where the country could be self-sustaining with American uh, support. Uh, I think we achieved that objective and then it was destroyed in our domestic division. But that's not the point I want to make now. The point I want to make now is we assumed that we could have a more or less united country in this difficult process. But the country became absolutely divided. When I was, the Vietnam War started when I was here. Uh, and at first, in a different administration, a different party, at first, the critique was that it was inadequately conducted or the objectives were not, well, it was a professional debate. Somewhere along the line, before the end of the Johnson term, it turned into a moral debate where a group of people thought that this country was so flawed that if it got out of Vietnam in what we considered an honorable way, it might do it again. And so it was in the American interest not to go along that gradual route. I'm not going to argue, obviously, you know what side I was on. Uh, now, should we have known that you could not do this over a four-year period? Uh, it's a good argument to make. But then if you ask me, okay, what would you have done then, assuming you realized that? Uh, in the middle of the Cold War, and even today, unilateral withdrawals are neither technically nor politically feasible. So then the temptation would have been either unilateral withdrawal or some attempt to bring it to a dramatic conclusion. And we didn't face that. So you can say that. On the other hand, I believe, though that is strongly contradicted by others, that by 1972, if America had stayed united, we could have preserved a better outcome than was finally achieved. But we don't have to settle that now. I'm just telling you now, or take the Middle East War of 73. Our strategy was to block any progress backed by Soviet arms until some Arab country was willing to start negotiations. And that turned out was a good strategy. But we did not calculate that one of these countries might go to war before it started negotiations. Because it was the unanimous opinion of all intelligence services of all countries that this couldn't happen because the 
imbalance was too great. So could we have been a little more farsighted? Maybe. Uh, but unfortunately, I'd have to say we couldn't have acted much differently. So you can go through uh, a number of situations, but we did not. Uh, the one thing I will certainly say is that we did not address the problem of developing countries and especially of global issues until too late in the Ford administration. Partly because there were so many other crises uh, we had to deal with. But if you say, would you like to do that part of it over? But I must tell you one other thing, because I've now that I'm uh, of an age that I thought uh, belonged only to others. <laughs> uh, uh, I've sometimes asked myself, supposing I were in office today, after all the thinking I've had a chance to do, uh, would I be a better secretary? And I've asked other secretaries this. And we all know and I think we have come to this view. I know more now. And I'm probably have a more balanced and a slightly less self-confident view. But would I be a better secretary? Because when you are in office, you have to act under pressure you have to act as if you were sure of what you're doing because you don't get rewarded for your doubts. And I haven't given myself a satisfactory answer to that. Probably to you, Nigel. Yeah. Good, well, good answer. <laughs> I think that's a good one, actually. We could continue our conversation here forever, but then we wouldn't give the audience a chance to ask questions if the... Uh, if you get the microphone. Up here. Uh, sorry, where are we? We have a microphone up here. It's a balcony. This one? There's two there. And then. Up here, the balcony. OK, just a second. We're going to hold the second, OK? The, uh, here's the ground rules. No speeches. Uh, identify yourself, your Harvard affiliation, and a short question. And the question ends with a question mark. And we'll try to have. Short answers as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander Rossolimo. I'm chairman of the Center for Security and Social Progress, a think tank. Dr. Kissinger, in the epilogue to your book on China, you quote a Chinese saying as follows, hide one's capabilities and bide one's time and endeavor to achieve something. So my question is how are we to interpret this statement? In the long term, do you see China pursuing a road of peaceful development or some other path? No, it's not a Chinese proverb. It's a maxim that Deng Xiaoping laid down uh, for his society uh, when he uh, asked him to implement the reforms uh, and it basically said what you say, uh, uh, never put yourself forward prominently. And you can interpret it two ways. You can say it's a maxim that should be followed forever. Or you can say it's a maxim that is put down on the theory that 20 years from now, you will be in a stronger position. And in my experience, there are Chinese that have both of these points of view. I do not know the answer to this, but I believe I have the answer to the following, to this aspect. Assuming 
what would we do differently if you assume that in 20 years something might happen? This is the problem of what Joe mentioned in the Crow Memorandum. Uh, if we act preemptively, uh, we will generate the nationalism and the fanaticism that is inevitable. If we act cooperatively, there is a chance that over 20 years a spirit of cooperation can develop. I would add, however, that this has to be done by both sides. It is not something the United States can do alone. And it means that the United States has to preserve the global equilibrium vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, China. So the answer to your question has to be, let's try to fill these 20 years as constructively as we can, because the China of today is already hugely different from the China under Mao that I first encountered. Uh, but I cannot give any guarantees. Uh, the guarantee has to be our performance. We can't make it dependent on Chinese performance alone. Good. Lady here on the left. Good afternoon, Nina Lazaridi, Masters of Liberal Arts in uh, International Relations Program. The question is, what change in political profile does Kremlin need to move Russian democracy and Russian-American relations in general? And does a candidate like Mikhail Prokhorov have a chance at presidency? Thank you. I didn't get the end of the question. Prokhorov. Prokhorov. Or any alternative to Putin, but Prokhorov, the... the uh, does a candidate like Prokhorov yeah. have, have a chance at presidency? Uh, <clears throat> Russia, first let me give you my analysis of the Russian situation. Uh, and then I'll say what America uh, uh, might do in relation to it. Here is a country that drew the greatest part of its history has defined itself by its imperial uh, activities. And it is uh, not a country like China that believed that its domestic culture was so unique that it could serve as an example for the rest of the world. So through the greatest part of its history, China, Russia expanded in all directions simultaneously. And it could do that because a mystical figure, a, mis a mystical, mystic figure like the Tsar was appealing to a Russian national uh, uh, spirit. So, but now Russia is in a position which is almost the opposite of its history. It has a frontier of 3,000 miles with China, which is a strategic nightmare, with 30 million Russians on one side and a billion Chinese on the other. It has a frontier of 2,000 miles with the Muslim world, which is an ideological nightmare because a growing part of the Russian population is Muslim. And those Muslims are all at the, or most of them, at the uh, border. Uh, and it has a frontier with Europe, which is a historical nightmare in the sense that it is a rejection of 300 years of Russian imperialism. So how to come to terms with this? And I think Putin is attempting to do that by an assertion of Russian nationalism, but it has only a very limited sphere 
in which he can really operate because of these uh, frontiers. And it has to be done by a country whose demography is in decline. Uh, it, is, uh, it has uh, one of the most unfavorable uh, demographic balances uh, uh, in the world. So this is what Putin is trying to do. In the process of some somewhat successful domestic policies, he has created a middle class that will be progressively asserting itself. Uh, now, what is the role of the United States? This is where I get into disagreement with uh, some of the uh, 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 academic view. Uh, I do not think we can fundamentally influence Russian domestic politics. We should try to shape a relationship where Russia gets used to living within its borders and doesn't appeal to the uh, nationalism, because if that happens, the tendencies which we have seen in the recent demonstrations are almost certain to assert themselves. And contrary to China, which is a growing and dynamic country, the Russian policy will on the whole have to be, whether it's Putin or anyone else, uh, more uh, defensive. So I think we can deal with Russia on issues like the Islamic world, on, despite what's going on in Syria, on a somewhat uh, uh, cooperative basis. But I would avoid the temptation of mixing into every, into the domestic politics of Russia to the degree that we are sometimes tempted to do. Okay, the gentleman in the loge. Uh, Min Lee, class of 2005. As uh, President Faust suggested in her opening remarks, you have an, an exceptionally deep philosophical background as an American statesman. So I wanted to ask how your background in political theory may have affected your approach as a statesman and how your experience as a statesman may have affected your views in political theory? You know, uh, when I started political theory here at Harvard, professors did not get into government. And uh, so when I studied it, I really studied it for my comprehension. Uh, I believe as a general proposition, that the best preparation for government is to study philosophy or political theory and history, because it trains your thinking and forces you to examine your uh, assumptions. But if you ask me in a precise way, which specific philosopher, uh, but some philosophers of history have affected my, uh, my thinking. Uh, uh, now, how about the other way around? Uh, I think as one reflects on one's experiences in public life, one is almost driven to philosophical reflection. Would you agree with Absolutely. that? Absolutely, yep. And, and my two colleagues here were... Painfully sometimes. <laughs> yes. Because the decisions that governments make that are important are always very narrow decisions. 51 to 49. So you have to steel yourself to act on insufficient knowledge 
in situations in which you have no choice except to act. And that requires a certain philosophical depth if you want to act wisely. But what do you think? You Absolutely. Hey, your old colleague, Ken Galbraith, uh, now deceased, had a good line. He said that in the really hard cases, you're choosing between the disastrous and the catastrophic. And it's hard to tell sometimes which one is which. That's Let's true. go to this gentleman. And, uh, yes, my name's Michael Borgson. I was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War and I was affiliated with several Harvard Peace Groups back in the early 70s. I'll put this in the form of a question. Um, you, you, you received the Nobel Peace Prize, I think in 73, was it correct? Correct. Uh, how do you justify receiving the Nobel Peace Prize when you're the architect of Richard Nixon of killing four million Southeast Asians during the Vietnam War, killing thousands of East Timorese and overthrowing legally elected President of Chile, Allende, and placed him with Pinochet in power, which resulted in the deaths of thousands of Chileans? Do you deny these, these, uh, these war crimes? Or do you, um, I ha basically, how do you sleep with yourself at night? I think we have the question. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's impossible to deal with all the inaccuracies that have been packed into one question. It's quite an achievement. Uh, I would urge those of you who really want to pursue these topics uh, to, to, to first on, on, on the Chilean question, just study the record of who did what, not what people who live of proving that their country is evil and that their leaders are criminals. But if you start from the assumption that rational people were in government, what led to what decisions? And what decisions were relevant to the accusations uh, made here? Now, you take the Vietnamese uh, war. Of the 24,000 people that you say were killed by Nixon, 12,000 of them were killed in the first year of the Nixon presidency, when the North Vietnamese started an offensive within three weeks of Nixon uh, coming into office. And what exactly would you have recommended that Nixon do on the day he come into office when they started an offensive, when people didn't even get know the office location in, in the White House? And then compare the remaining casualties with the millions that were killed when the communists took over the countries of, uh, of Indochina. And then perhaps you'd be a little more careful in throwing around accusations like this. Nobody had a bigger interest in ending the war in Vietnam than the people who were in office. I started working on that before I was in office, uh, when I uh, uh, started a peace initiative that was sent back by the, uh, by the administration. What do you think possessed us? Uh, and what wisdom do you have of what could have been done uh, when the only issue between us and the South Vietnam and the North Vietnamese was, would we begin the process of settlement by overthrowing the government that our predecessors had put in place and putting in a communist government in its place? And we've seen now what that communist government would have done. That was the only issue. All the other issues were negotiated. But those of you who really want to understand this, read the records of negotiation, read the minutes of NEC meetings, and you may not agree with it, but you won't throw around words like war criminal there. Okay, thank you.
So let's, let's go to the lady on the left. Good afternoon. My name is Daniela Martinez. Um, I'm a student at the law school from Chile. And I want to ask a, a question in the vein of Professor Nye's qu nice question. Yeah. Um, decades after the 1973 military coup in Chile, is there anything in the relationship of the United States with Chile immediately before the coup and during the military government that you would um, change? In the period immediately before, the situation in the period immediately before the coup uh, uh, was, it was as follows. Uh, the uh, Allende, we were totally preoccupied with Vietnam, the Middle East war, and, 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 and similar issues. There were no, you're talking about the period immediately before, in the two years between Allende's coming into office and the coup, there was no, not a single uh, 40 committee meeting, which is the group that dealt with covert operation. What happened was that, and that uh, what America did, they, we cut off a relatively, a very small $60 million aid program, uh, but we continued uh, uh, re, what, what is the word for it? the international debt? Uh, Renegotiate or refinance? We, we permitted the refinancing of the, uh, of the debt, and we continue to give money to the uh, uh, universities and other humanitarian things. Uh, the internal situation in Chile was reaching a point in the summer of 73 in which the Supreme Court declared uh, acts of the Allende government unconstitutional and the uh, uh, parliament uh, asked the military to play a role but not to take over. At that point, uh, there was the coup. All political parties in Chile at first uh, supported the coup and because they thought it would be a step to democracy. So the decided point was when it was apparent that Pinochet did not intend to give up power, uh, at that point could we have done more Possibly, probably, uh, but uh, after all, there were three administrations after us and it did not prove to be an easy process. But the coup itself, painful as it is to, for our critics to accept, was not encouraged by the United States. And it, was, it is different in 71, there we were involved. In 73, we were not involved. And it w re resulted from internal Chilean developments, in part from Allende bringing in Cuban troops, in part from the uh, economic mess uh, that existed there. And, but we, we were very unhappy with Allende. But I don't understand why people are so worried about Allende and so delighted when Mubarak is overthrown. So, Henry, we're at our witching hour, but do you want to take another question or two, or should we? Up uh, to you, yes. Let's see, how about, uh, we have many pe patient people. We're going to be very quick, short questions and short answers. This gentleman, please. I'm John Trump for Harvard Law School. President Faust mentioned you running the international seminars, one of your contributions to Harvard. But over the decades, documents have trickled out from the FBI and the Boston office saying that you supplied the names of students and the participants and a lot of background on them to the FBI offices at that time, in the 1950s. So I'd like you to maybe try to explain or give a little more background. What was the reasons for that at the time and what 
You know, what were you trying to accomplish? Um, we were trying, we were, the, the list of the students were publicly available. There was no secret uh, about, uh, about the students. Uh, so yeah, I don't know what- The you contacted them though. They do overtly say that in the document. That I contacted them? Yes, you contacted the FBI, yes. I don't know what specifically they could possibly refer to. So the lady in the loge, please. Hi. Oh, I'm kind of short. Um, my name is Ting Ting Liu. I'm a freshman at the college, and I have a very short question, I promise. So clearly you've been, uh, had to deal with a lot of controversial issues, and I think you're handling them be all, all of today's events beautifully. Um, I just want to ask, what is, was one of the hardest decisions of your life, and how, what, what did you have to think about, and how do you feel about it now? Hardest decision of your life. Hardest. Could be personal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly didn't uh, give up Smokey. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll skip that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not too, it's... It's too long. Uh, it's too, too, too hard. Too personal, <laughs> okay. So this lady on the, le on the left, please. Um, my name is Harleen Gambier. I'm a sophomore at the college. Dr. Kissinger, uh, my question is a little bit more lighthearted and it deals with undergraduate life at the college. Uh, the undergraduate population has been a buzz for the past few days. Adam's house, which is your former house that you lived in as an undergraduate, two days ago declared, um, issued a declaration of war against Courier House in the Radcliffe <laughs> Quadrangle. And since then, there's been an array of entangling alliances and threats passing all around. And, I was wondering, given your experience, your rich experience with diplomacy and conflict and negotiation, <laughs> what, what uh, advice you have for you know, Harvard statesmen that are now dealing with conflict amongst themselves? <laughs> are you gonna support Adam's house, Uber well, Of course I'd, I'd support Adam's house. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman on the left. Dr. Kinsinger, um, I'm Emmanuel from Brazil. I'm, doing a, I'm pursuing a Master of Laws degree here. I would like to ask you, uh, for many years, Latin America countries and other countries that now are considered emerging were not taken into consideration by American diplomacy. So how do you see now uh, the American necessity to deal with Brazil, India, South Africa, and other countries? Because so far during this exposition, we only had the opportunity to hear uh, about China. So if you could. No, uh, it's a good point to make because mm -hmm. not only Brazil, but Europe, yeah. India, yeah. are uh, countries of huge importance. Uh, Brazil is the country in Latin America that has perhaps the most uh, fully elaborated international uh, policy and it's designed to achieve a kind of South American bloc. Uh, and I've always had a great sympathy for this. Uh, there is this aspect of American policy towards Latin America that is we're thinking about. Most American administrations have tried to develop a new policy for Latin America. And most American administrations have come up with the idea of some kind of partnership. And it has never really fully happened. Uh, it, the Kennedy administration had it. Uh, we had it also. And now, the, what, what, why doesn't it fully happen? Because one reason is that until fairly recently, the Latin American countries were really insulated from international politics. And they could afford to take measures in the inter-American context that would have been risky or dangerous in a, in a, in a wider context. But of the South American countries, Brazil is certainly developing into a 
key role in the hemisphere. And I believe it's important for us to treat Brazil in the, uh, in these, in the international bodies to deal with development and financial question uh, with great seriousness and with regular consultation. <coughs> but I think it's happening. And uh, I believe this relationship is developing very effectively. Since I've already let the event run uh, 15 minutes beyond its schedule hour, and since I'm hoping that we're going to be persuasive to get uh, Dr. Kissinger to come back, I better observe my instructions. So let me say on behalf of all of us who've had a chance to participate in this conversation, how for somebody who's 88 years young and writes faster and better than any of the rest of us, how pleased we are to have you back and how, we, how much we look forward to your coming back again. And thank you very much. Well done.